Welcome back to this series of Black Hat Fast Chats. Terry Sweeney here with Black Hat. I'm joined now by Juan Andres Guerrero Sade, Principal Threat Researcher with Sentinel Labs. Juan Andres, appreciate you joining us today. My pleasure. Um, you, you bring a, a, an impressive resume. You're also an adjunct professor of strategic studies at John Hopkins. Um, you also have some security experience with both Google and Kaspersky. Um, and uh, maybe the most interesting point on your resume is uh, the joint work on the Moonlight Maze at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, um, it's been quite a ride. Uh, it's, it's outside the scope of this conversation, but maybe you'll come back for our episode on uh, uh, spying and security. I'd love to. That'd be great. Um, in the meantime, um, we're here to talk a bit more about the threat landscape. Tell us a bit from your perspective, how has that threat landscape changed over the last year? So it's been very interesting. I mean, over the years, we've seen this kind of trickle down of uh, more advanced capabilities, right? You used to have a pyramid. Uh, let's say the internet of the late 90s, we were just talking about, you know, mostly denial of service attacks, hacktivist defacements, the kind of things that you would consider just nuisances. Um, and most of the advanced capabilities were always at the top of that pyramid with, let's say, like a 1% of actors that most folks didn't have to deal with for the most part. What we've seen over the past, you know, eight, 10 years has been, you know, it's no longer a pyramid. It's more like a square. Financial actors have great capabilities. They're using exploits. They're targeted. They're uh, very well resourced. And of course, there's been an explosion of nation state actors that are, you know, doing all kinds of things. Uh, so it's just a very different landscape altogether and one where it's very difficult to prioritize what it is that you should be, you know, protecting yourself from when everybody's got these high powered capabilities everywhere. It just strikes me that the, you're talking about the, the, the box has changed shape. I mean, it feels like it's a cloud shape now and we're, we're in a, a basically a, an era of uh, malware as a service, essentially. Yeah, it, it's a whole ecosystem, right? So if you look at the financially motivated ecosystem, uh, you literally have tiers. You've got this sort of organized crime having stepped into the scene and there's a tier of developers that are taking a cut. There's affiliates that are taking a cut. There's folks that are just selling access to certain networks, you know, high value enterprises. And you basically just see the, you know, the money being pieced apart uh, at every tier and there being this thriving criminal ecosystem that's now involved in the malware scene. Something that I think we would have thought unthinkable uh, five, 10 years ago. It, it just didn't sure. work that way. Um, malware is in the news, uh, unfortunately, just about daily. And I'm, I'm wondering what, what you're seeing or what your takeaways are from the uh, essentially pandemic of, of, of ransomware that we, we've seen hit globally. Well, to be perfectly candid, um, there was a time when I was more than happy to ignore financially motivated malware. I mean, I, I was just focused on targeted attacks and cyber espionage, and that was where the interesting things were happening. Uh, I can't do that anymore, right? Ransomware has essentially taken over. Um, I think it's important to kind of piece apart that ransomware has changed a whole lot. It, it's not an entirely new idea, right? The first bit of ransomware came out in 89. It's about as old as I am. Um, and you basically had to uh, write a check and mail it to a guy in Panama hoping to get your files back. Obviously that didn't take off. It wasn't very successful. <laughs> uh, now we've got, you know, between uh, this sort of anonymous uh, modes of payment that have taken out all the money muling and all the complications out of the financial side um, and the rise of more targeted forms of, of intrusions and, and deployment of ransomware, it's a whole different world, right? We've got folks uh, getting extorted for seven, eight figure sums. Uh, you've got supply chain attacks to distribute not just to one targeted enterprise, but rather to hundreds at a time. Uh, it's just discouraged that, you know, we can't seem to get away from. All right. Um, shifting gears slightly, uh, talk a bit about what's happened to cyber espionage act actors. Well, that, that's near and dearer to my heart. Uh, so I, I've always enjoyed that bit of research. They always seem to have the more, you know, more interesting malware, more interested attack chains. The motivations tend to be more varied than just getting <laughs> money. Uh, but a lot of things have changed, right? We've, we've seen this explosion of APTs, of advanced persistent threats, and it seems like every nation on Earth is in some way involved in the cyber espionage scene. Uh, but they've also been reacting to a lot of the changes and a lot of the involvement from the government and the private sector. 
So some of the biggest clusters that you would think of, whether it's you know, the Chinese clusters or the Russian clusters uh, of, of threat actors, have changed according to the pressure that's been put on them from the US government, from the DOJ, uh, from a lot of the private sector, you know, chasing down SOFA C APT28 and all these guys uh, from the you know, summer of election hacks. Uh, that amount of pressure has actually made these groups restructure and retool. Um, and in many ways, we've lost a lot of our collective visibility as an industry into what these folks are doing. Uh, so it's really interesting to see, you know, there's a lot more adoption of open source tools, of commodity malware. Cobalt Strike Beacon has become a part of basically every attack chain that you can think of, whether it's uh, you know, financially motivated actors or nation state actors like Noble Baron, Nobelium. Um, it's really interesting to see that what used to be the tier of folks that worked on the most custom malware, uh, on the most distinctive attack chains, are now using pretty much the same tools that, you know, we would expect script kiddies to use. So it's become much harder to piece these things apart. Well, Andres, let's finish by just addressing uh best practices that you advise uh, customers these days. The, the, the world has changed a lot, certainly in the last 15 months. Um, what's, what's top of mind for best practices where customers are concerned? Well, I'm usually told to, to try to emphasize best practices at the end. I tend to kind of be the doom and gloom and just say, look, everything is bad. <laughs> uh, so yeah, best practices tends to be a, a good, good point to leave off on. Um, obviously, my... Um, emphasis is almost always on endpoint security, not just because of you know, where I've had the pleasure of working, but rather because it's where you get most of the forensic artifacts for the type of research that I do. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have whatever endpoint security of your security solution of your choosing actually gives you a deep sense of visibility into you know, all the different operating systems in your fleet, all of the systems that you're managing in a given enterprise and centralizes it in a way that you can actually search for it. Uh, it's the kind of thing that I need coming into an organization and, and trying to figure out what's happened with a certain attack uh, to be able to see what's going on with more ephemeral infection chains, things that are um, basically memory resident and never touch this, um, and to be able to retain that somewhere. So if I can emphasize the best practice that I think doesn't get emphasized enough, it's data retention. So it's great to have all this sort of security telemetry, all these different things that are generating telemetry. Um, but one of the costs that most organizations don't really want to deal with and should is that of retaining that data for as long as possible. Most attacks, most advanced attacks don't get discovered within their first six months. So if you're throwing away most of your telemetry, most of your logs, most of your endpoint telemetry uh, within the first week or two in order to cut costs, it means that when incident responders come in for an inevitable breach, there's really nothing to work with. So, you know, if, if folks can just take it to heart that it's actually worth the investment in whatever you know, solution of your choosing, um, it'll make a huge difference for us as, as researchers and as responders to be able to help folks uh, when the time comes. Well, Andres, thanks for the view of the, the, the new threat landscape as well as what we can do to make ourselves safer. Appreciate you joining us on this fast chat today. My pleasure, thank you. We've been talking with Juan Andres Guerrero Sade of Sentinel Labs. This has been Terry Sweeney from Black Hat. Thanks for joining us for this fat chat, and we'll see you next time.